Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. Believe in a path. Yeah, that's right. Keep breathing because uh, <laughs> that's how you stay alive. Broadcasting from Huntington Beach, California, and New York City, coast to coast. Big welcome from the Big Apple and from the City of Angels to all our listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the caregiver's caregiver. Dave Nassani coming to you live from the syndicated all positive talk radio network, healthylife.net. Broadcasting in all 50 states and 135 countries with my lovely late co-host Adrian Gruberg from thecaregiverspace.org, and she'll be showing up pretty quick, don't worry. And just a reminder that all our shows are available on demand at healthylife.net and our membership website, caregiverdave.com. And we're proud that the Caregiver Dave show was voted number one caregiver podcast of the top 50 on Player FM and one of the top six best podcasts on caring.com as well as being voted number three out of thousands of caregiver podcasts on Feedspot. And if you go right now to caregiverdave.com, you can get my first book about overcoming hardships, unbelievable hardships, absolutely free, as well as our free burnout quiz that you can take. So do that right now before we get to our guest. And we do have an exciting show planned for you today. We will be interviewing author of You Can't Drive Your Car to Your Own Funeral, Silly, <laughs> Anne Marie Hancock. But first, I want to take this opportunity to thank our last guest. When life gets crazy, uh, can you keep your cool? Our guest was mindfulness expert last time, Julie Potaker, author of the new book, Life Falls Apart, But You Don't Have to. Mindful, ex mindful methods for staying calm in the midst of chaos. That's a lot of big words in there. Julie, um, it does a great job in just helping you to stay calm in the midst of chaos. So like it says, you can watch or listen to that interview and all our interviews on the healthylife.net network or on our membership website, caregiverdave.com. All right, enough of that. For 30 years, Anne-Marie was in television and radio, local and national, and she was honored in the International Year of the Child for her work with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. She was the only woman invited to speak at the first papal conference in America and the author of three books. Anne Marie, welcome to the show, and I'm so excited to have you on. Are you unmuted, I wonder? Thank you. Can yes. you hear me, Dave? Yes, we can hear you. And, <laughs> and I can welcome, hear you. And so welcome well. to the show, Adrian Gruberg. Better <laughs> Thank <late> you. Than <laughs> ever. <laughs> Hi, Adrian. She was probably fighting Hi. Manhattan traffic or something. You know, it's always hard to live in Manhattan. There's yes, always something is. going on, <laughs> especially <laughs> when the president is in town. <laughs> He's not. So, Anne Marie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he's in court today or something. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> I like to ask my guests to take a minute, a minute or two and just tell us who is Anne Marie Hancock and why was she put on this earth? What an interesting right. question. Right. What an interesting question. Oh, I sorry. believe I am here for <laughs> one purpose, and that is to communicate love, to live it, to be it to speak it, to act it. Words are uh, deep, right? It's action <laughs> that matters. It's action. Right. And I've tried to use the media, Dave, through the years to help other people. A quick example would be in Richmond when I was doing uh, an hour-long broadcast. We used to have the mayor on probably uh, once every couple weeks for an update, and he wanted to talk about revitalization of the city. But I wanted to talk about moving a bus stop for the handicapped at the Virginia <laughs> home. And so I would just gravitate to my own topic and was very, very blessed to get a bus stop move for what was then the Virginia Home for Incurables, now called the Virginia Home. <laughs> so love is what it's about, love. 
I like to think that I... You got the bases covered. What'd you say? You like to uh, show it, uh, live it, what else? Live it, speak it, communicate it, Mm -hmm. and look around constantly because we don't have to look far in our own home, in our own community uh, for people who need us. There's always someone who needs us. So true. All we got to do is look around. We can probably touch somebody who's that close. Exactly. Of that somebody close. who needs I, our love. I spent uh, 20 years, Dave, with the healing ministry. Um, tra- uh, traveling, it took me all over the world. Uh, Venezuela, mm. Italy. Mm. What I'm saying is I've spent 20 years with the terminally ill, both the elderly and children. And it's probably the most humbling experience of my entire life. Mm. They taught me more than I could ever learn anywhere or did learn anywhere. And what kind of healing? Uh, Prayer healing or other kinds? Yes, prayer healing. Prayer healing. Yes, I'm not Mm. a physician. There's only one, God. And then we have these people on the earth here. They're just practicing. Educated (laughs) guests, right? Yes. Pay them for an educated guess. And, you know, that's <laughs> that's something, too. I have run into so many people in my travels oh. that put our physicians and surgeons on a pedestal. Mm. I have always felt they are no different than we. We all have different gifts, talents, and skills, and we are paying them for an educated guess. That being the fact, uh, when we are caretaking, Sometimes we have to be bold. Uh, We have to speak up, hopefully lovingly, but we need to do that. And I've met so many that, but he's a doctor. But Mm -hmm. I had my (laughs) own uh, extraordinary experience. Uh, My mother was terminal with cancer. She had a 14-hour operation. She was 90 years old. And I stayed with her the night. They took the top of her head. They took the side of her face. She had a large turban on, only her eyes, nose, and mouth exposed. Mm -hmm. And the surgeon came in at 5.30 in the morning and said, Mrs. Carricker, are you ready to go home? (laughs) This is with drainage tube (laughs) in the neck. I looked from the corner where he didn't see me and said, Mrs. Carricker, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> we have to be her the advocate. voice. Yeah. We're, we're all advocates. And when we're communicators, I think that we are entrusted <laughs> with using our voices to do more and for a better purpose. And it wasn't just my mom. As I said, there are so many that are they are intimidated by surgeons. They're intimidated by bosses. They may even be intimidated by family members. And we have that opportunity every moment of our lives to, with a smile and with some love, communicate firmness. We need to have some boundaries and uh, I had a a lot of experience learning boundaries with my mom she was a beautiful (laughs) flex woman but um, I don't like the word difficult but mom was very challenging we had to change doctors several times and then there were times we couldn't change doctors and I would have to say mama This is the one that's going to take care of us right now. But uh, mom has always been uh, very much in control. You and I were talking, Dave, before the show about her car, which takes Mm -hmm. you to the title of the book, Can't Drive Your Car to Your Own Funeral. Cars are very (laughs) symbolic in psychology. They represent us and going to... (laughs) or away from something. And they are symbols, even the colors. And mom's car was red. And I was saying, Adrian, before the show, my mom's license plate was perfect. (laughs) P-R-R-C-T. But when she was in that car, she was totally in charge. So obviously, (laughs) 
so many of our seniors get sick and they're weak and they can no longer do that. They feel out of control. And my mom, towards the end of her bouts with cancer, desperately wanted to drive her own car. Mm -hmm. I can remember one day she wanted to have lunch with my son. And so you become sort of a master of diplomacy. Well, mom, <laughs> I'll drive today. I know you're tired. No, Ann, you won't. You drive like the most. <laughs> most. You know, and you have to keep your sense of humor. I would say, Mom, when did you see Moses drive? She'd go, you're not funny. You never were. <laughs> and she would lose, or I would lose. She would win the battle. So we're going across the bridge. She ran two stoplights right through <laughs> red light at major intersections. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the first one and a couple Hail Marys, I said, Mama, I think you ran through a stoplight. She goes, Ann, don't worry about it. Your father did it all the time. <laughs> and that, no more discussion. But she was, um, knew what she wanted and was not shy about speaking. There was one day that we were driving, I thought, uh, for a CAT scan, and uh, obviously we weren't because halfway through our journey, she said, Ann, you're a moron. <laughs> I pulled the car to the side of the road, and I said, "What, Mama, are you upset? What did you say? She said, you're a moron. And I thought for a moment, and I said, you know what? I was in Ireland a couple years ago researching the family name, M-O-R-A-N, and it's pronounced more. <laughs> we. <laughs> we can diffuse, you know, Adrian, so many situations. You're a peacemaker. With humor, you know, and humor has always served me. Oh, yeah. Always served it's me. It's dry humor, I, but it's humor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's funny because I had read this book on stress and it really disturbed me because uh, the studies at the Mayo Clinic indicated that 78 to 99% of disease is stress related. 78 to 99%. That being the case, we know definitively that stress changes the chemical structure of the cells. They have now tied it to ischemic heart attack. They've tied it to stroke. Uh, they've tried, tied it to diabetes, tied stress to diabetes. So if it's only 99%, uh, <laughs> we need to seriously contemplate how are we handling stress. And for me, at the top of my sheet is God. I'm a prayer warrior. And just under that is a sense of humor. I, I just have to laugh at everything. I'd come to the door and I'd say, I brought chicken salad. And she'd yeah. go, no, not again. How many <laughs> times are you going to bring that? I'd put it back in the car and just smile. And obviously we're concerned too when we know that life is short. Uh, we're concerned a little bit about their spiritual well-being. So uh -huh. I would bring, right, I'd bring a battery of books in, maybe once a week because you don't want to be too pushy. And um, I'd just kind of leave them by the chair and I'd say, Mom, maybe you want to look at some of these. She'd look back. She'd say, Ann, you need some Nora Roberts, some good love stories. You need to <laughs> like that. And wow. out it would go. She was so, 90, you said, uh, when, when she left? 90. Her. Sharp and, as a jack, uh, though. Yeah, wow, you're very fortunate. Did she go quickly? Um, it was a three-year journey, and mm -hmm. I kept a journal during that period, yeah. uh, which became the book. But um, she never addressed cancer. Never. Mm. She never said the word, not one time in the journey. 
And the month before she died, she said, Anne, I saw a commercial on TV for a chiropractor. I said, you did? She said, I'm going to go see him in the spring and have him fix my spine. <laughs> and that was that. I mean, her spine was cracked uh, from the cancer, but she right. would never speak specifically to the cancer. And as far as going back to the spiritual uh, part of the journey, I became a little more concerned and I thought, I know what I'll do. She loves this priest, Father Glass. <laughs> I'll call Father Glass. And I did. And I said, Father, I, I, I have a concern. I think Mom is very close to the end and she will not talk about God at all. And she wants me to haul all the books out that I bring. And I'm stumped. Do you think maybe you could just call her and chat and say what's up and let her go and see what she says? He said, all right, I'll give it a shot. Father Glass called her. He called me back in two minutes. I said, did you <laughs> talk <minute>. to her? <laughs> two. She said, hello. He said, hello. He said, how are you? She said, great. How are you? And that was about the end of the conversation. <laughs> I'm terminated. So I'm My interested, father, before you yeah. do that, I, I'm interested in, uh, in what kind of relationship you had with your mother before you were her caregiver and after. What, what changes took place and how did it change you? And you only have um, four minutes to answer that before we take a break. <laughs> I, I am used to time cues, so I will uh, just shoot here. Mm -hmm. uh, my relationship with my mom was always a good one. I loved her. I loved her very, very much. But um, challenging. Uh, for instance, uh, I had told you I was in television. And mom had said to me, you have a glamour hang up. You need to leave TV. And at one point, I actually did. And I went to teach small children. I love children. I just love being with them. They're these innocent, open, honest receptacles of love. And I received some awards for it. And where do we go when we receive an award? We go home because nobody cares <laughs> but family. So I went home and I said, this happened today. This is just so wonderful. I'm so happy. She says, what are you talking about teaching? You belong in television. Why did you leave TV? <laughs> but there is something very important to say here. Because I owned whatever it was she said to me. She wanted me out of TV. I left. She wanted me out of teaching. I went back to television. Oh. And what I have learned since and caring for her is that one we can't own everything everyone says to us. We must believe in ourselves and trust our own judgment. No one knows us better than we do. And it took me a long time to learn that. And when mom would say moron, it stung. And when mm -hmm. she'd say, I don't want the chicken salad, why do you keep bringing it? It stung. Yeah. And it took... A lot of prayer and going home each night, which I truly did. And I would say to God, I, I came up with a zero again today. I don't think I did anything right. She's not happy with me. She doesn't like the books that I bring. Lord, help me. Help me to go back in there tomorrow and speak as you would speak. Hear as you would hear. And love as you would love. And I would do that every <laughs> single night, every night. And after a fashion, I didn't hear any ugliness or any unkindness because it was gone. I programmed it out. And I would just laugh. It's like moron. Yes, maybe so. We're all morons. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Well, listen, we're going to take a break. So we will be right back. Don't go away. Anytime we suffer loss, we grieve. And a lot of people don't realize what even the grief process is. But it could be 
five to seven steps ranging from denial, I don't believe this is happening, anger, oh my gosh, I'm so upset this is happening, to a form of bargaining, how can I get out of this, to depression, which is a very serious thing because that often leads to suicide. And then finally, finally, after you realize you have no more control over your situation and you're totally okay with the new normal that it brings, that wonderful, wonderful place called acceptance. And we're back with Anne-Marie Hancock and my lovely co-host Adrian Gruberg. I'm Dave Nassani on the Caregiver Dave Show here on the HealthyLife.net network, all positive radio, nothing negative there. So I wanted to ask you, since you went through so many years of your life needing your mother's approval and doing whatever she told you, you were uh, yeah. just such a very good girl listening yes. to your mother, <laughs> following that commandment, I honor was, thy I mother was, and thy father so that your life may be long. <laughs> now that she's gone, uh, I assume you got over doing uh, or needing that from her at, su at one point, but now that she's gone, uh, I bet you miss it. Um, I, I probably need to say that during the process of caretaking, I learned to own myself. I learned, because I had to, to speak for myself. And it began with things like this, my mother would say, I'm not going to that doctor, I don't like him, I think he's obnoxious, tell him to go away. And I started standing my ground. Mom, he's very well credentialed. He's very well thought of. We're going to see this doctor. And it felt good. I mean, it really felt good. How did so she react? I think the, um, she was stunned. She was mm -hmm. stunned because you called me the good girl. I was. Anything she wanted, I wanted to make her happy. And even caretaking, I truly wanted to make her happy. I knew it was challenging. I knew she was lonely. I knew she was suffering. I knew she was making this journey alone. I wanted to make her smile, and I wanted her to feel the love that I have for her, but also the love that God has for her. And so reflecting, as you said, Dave, after all was said and done, I thought to myself, you know what? I've grown up. I've learned to speak for myself because at one given point in time, I was in charge of another life and it was serious and my decisions had to be my own. Her cancer had gone to her brain, but mm -hmm. it was part of a process where I learned to speak for myself and I'm very grateful for that. I'm grateful for the process. It made me a better person. I, I have a problem with patience. You know, I want really? everything yesterday. You seem very yeah. patient. <laughs> no, I'm really not. I want everything to happen yesterday. And um, illness, we don't know how long. Uh, we don't know what direction it will take. And so I, I learned, just wait on, on the Lord. He has the perfect plan. He knows everybody every mind, every soul, and he will instruct me. And I trusted it. I trusted it. I tell you, I, I also learned something about forgiveness. I always thought as a child that forgiveness was um, no matter what, you just go up to the person, you face them eyeball to eyeball, and you say, I'm sorry. And that's very hard for a lot of people. But taking care of mama each day required a little bit of forgiveness. Not one, to take things personally. And to know she wasn't targeting me. She was frightened. She was mm -hmm. alone. 
She was making this journey she couldn't even articulate and wouldn't because she was so strong-willed. And so I had to learn to forgive her each day, but also to forgive myself. Because as I pointed out initially, I would go home and say, oh Lord, I was such a failure. I, I, I didn't even bring the right sandwich. Mm -hmm. And I really believe it was prayer and God that helped me get past what now seem to me little things that don't matter. Chicken mm. salad or a hamburger, so what? <laughs> right. right. And we, we, we just magnify these things in our mind. And then we go home and in quiet time, blow them up. And what does it do? It creates stress in the body, creates disease in the body. And well, I, I keep question. thinking about that book, 78 to 99% of disease yeah. comes from stress. We need to deal with it. So how did you become so godly, and how did she not? Well, I think my mom was godly in her own way. <laughs> um, I would like to share something towards the end of her life. She loved St. John Paul. And so I gave her another book, hauled another one in there. And, you mean the Pope? Uh, huh? The Pope, You mean yes. the Pope? Yes, she loved him. She loved Pope John Paul. So I found the book. I brought the book. I put it by her chair. I said, I think you'll love this. The next day, she told me to take it out <laughs> and to, again, lighten up. You know, I needed to watch Andy Griffith, Archie Bunker, and get a lot <laughs> And so um, when my mother passed, well, first of all, the very next day when she told me to take it out, she said, hey, before I walked out the door, she said, I read a couple prayers in there. I read a little about them, but get it out, okay? <laughs> I said, all right, mama. My mother died on the feast day of Pope John Paul. <laughs> Yes, yes. And you asked about my life. I have always had a devotion uh, to the Blessed Mother since I was a little girl. Um, I went to a Catholic school, uh, St. Bridget's, and then another, St. Gertrude. But I really believe that I established an intimate relationship with God when my husband and I lost our child. Mm. It was stunning. I was very young. Uh, I took life for granted, and um, we worked through it. I have the most incredible husband. We've been married 50 years, just a wow. few months ago. Yes, I love him so much. <laughs> but together, we weathered that, and it taught me so much about life, how precious that all we have is now. All we have is today. Very, very, very important. And then on my 50th birthday, my husband had planned this beautiful party in the mountains at our place up there. And uh, we had no sooner arrived, and I collapsed, and my heart stopped. And the rescue squad is right behind our place up there. Ooh. And they called uh, them. They took me in an ice storm over the top of the mountain, and I woke up three days later. They had resuscitated me, of course. Mm. The doctors were at the foot of the bed with my husband, who never left, and the children. And the doctor said, Mrs. Hancock, do you know who the President of the United States is? <laughs> I said, of course. Everyone knows it's Hillary Clinton. <laughs> the doctors looked a little upset. And I think my husband said, she's back. And I was. But when you die, and I tell people it's not so bad. It was very <laughs> peaceful. I died once. But when that happens to you again, you become aware that time is a gift. It's precious. And you ask yourself constantly, 
What am I doing with it? What am I doing with it? How can I make a difference? And so that is part of the tapestry of my life that changed me. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to take another break on that note. And don't go okay. away. We'll be right back. Dave Nassani, the caregiver's caregiver, has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too, Thrive to Stay Alive as a Caregiver. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through because he is one. He now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his amazing caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out, thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child. And caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life too. Thrive and stay alive as a caregiver will help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life and learn to put their needs first. Pick up your copy today or buy one for your special caregiver on sale everywhere and at caregiverdave.com. And we're back with Anne Marie Hancock, Hancock, and Adrian Gruberg. I'm Dave Nassani. We're on the Caregiver Dave Show on the HealthyLife.net network. And I wanted to ask you: you you haven't spoken much about uh, your father or your wife's, uh, your your mother's <laughs> husband. Were they together for as long as you guys were to your husband? Yes, yes, they were. They had been Was married. Was she her some caregiver time. at one point? Was what now? Tell me was again. Was she or you her care? Uh, his caregiver his at care. one point. Um, <laughs> my father died <laughs> very suddenly after mm. my mother was diagnosed with cancer. Uh. Uh, he went to bed and just didn't wake up during this process. He played tennis at eighty nine, three wow. times a week. Yeah. He was an avid bridge player, never had a sick day in his life. And uh, he just uh, couldn't handle uh, my mother's cancer diagnosis. You think the stress and, uh, killed him then? I do. I do. I believe that firmly. Because he would say to me, I took mom to all the CAT scans, radiation, doctor's appointments, everything. And sometimes he could go, sometimes he couldn't. He mm -hmm. just, he said to me, I can't handle it. Mm -hmm. I can't handle it. And so he passed uh, very, very quickly. It was stunning. It really was. How did your mother react to him passing? Um, she was, mother is very stoic. Um, mm -hmm. Very stoic. You know, I was sharing with you the story about calling the priest. Mm -hmm. When they buried my father, I remember standing, it was a really windy day, under that tent at Mount Calvary. And Father Glass went and took my mom's hands, and he said, Eileen, what can I do for you? She said, nothing. I'm going home to watch Notre Dame football. <laughs> so this is what manifest to us yeah and uh just no no real discussion ever about the things that really matter she could talk about and she was bright she was a registered nurse she was very bright but she would talk about the weather uh she would talk about a restaurant her car the car was everything yeah, because in that car, she was independent and strong. Mm -hmm. But not the things that mattered. After Dad passed, I tried on numerous occasions to say, what are you feeling, Mom? Just share anything you're feeling, anything you want to say. Just open your heart. It's just me and a banana. Mm -hmm. And and a banana. And you always have to be so heavy. Why do you have to be so heavy? I said, I just thought, you might like to talk. 
because unfortunately we all respond the way we would respond and for me when I would pick and choose my own time I would need to talk about it I would need to process that's the way I do it but not mom I don't know when she processed it was like the conversation with father glass two minutes I'm great she was gone a couple months later um, amazing I'm gonna see the chiropractor in the spring he's gonna fix this and I would just let her say whatever she wanted to say why mm -hmm. because it made her happy I think in her heart of hearts she had to know the truth and if she didn't want to share that that was fine sometimes in caretaking I think silence is best we we just sit and we listen and whatever she would say I would just nod and listen but mm. we never went too deep we never went too deep yeah. I want to talk about this book and um, we've got only got yeah. two, two minutes before break so tell me why you wrote it in these two minutes then after the break we'll go uh, deeper into it okay I wrote it because I learned so many lessons and doing and having a healing ministry for some 20 years as I said that took me all over the world I was a real smarty pants <laughs> I thought I had all the answers and my mom our Lord it's as good as he said Anne Marie try this there is nothing like caretaking in your own family horse of a different color completely yeah. different so what I had to acquire new tools I had to acquire a new attitude and the things that I garnered from that experience are priceless and I felt they deserve to be shared awesome Good answer. Well, well, <laughs> roughly quiet today Adrian well um, I'm listening <laughs> good that's why God gave us two ears and only one mouth we're supposed to listen yeah. <laughs> twice as long as we speak so we'll be right back don't go away one arm one leg 100 words overcoming unbelievable hardships is about Charlene a stroke survivor back in 1996 Charlene was a healthy normal very active 52 year old woman whose amazing talents resemble that of both a Martha Stewart and a Wonder Woman but all that changed when she suffered a massive stroke that left her severely speech impaired and paralyzed on the right side. Who am I? My name is David. I've had the privilege of being Charlene's husband since 1975. We had a wonderful fairy tale storybook like courtship that culminated in our marriage a year later. Charlene had just come out of a marriage where after 10 years she received two black eyes and a broken nose by her former husband when he came home high on speed. Charlene believed in no second chances of any kind for abuse, so she left. Finding herself all alone in the world with her five and ten year old daughters Cynthia Lorraine and Deborah Lynn, she started raising them by herself for the next two years. Then fate brought us all together. After falling in love with Charlene, Cindy and Debbie, our love then produced Rebecca Elizabeth. We had a wonderful normal life for the next 20 years. But today, things are very different for everyone. How about the reaction of nine-time Grammy and Dev Award recipient, the godfather of contemporary gospel Christian music, Andre Crouch? Charlene just won't let the promises of God go, and she has not let her circumstances get in the way of her faith. She's not just a survivor, she's more than a conqueror, as the Bible states. You'll be encouraged by her testimony, regardless of what you're going through. Available everywhere. Welcome back to the show. Caregiver Dave here, Dave Nassani, caregiverdave.com. And Marie Hancock is our guest. And Adrian Gruberg from the Caregiver Space is my co-host. <laughs> so can you maybe go a little deeper in the book? Like, is there your favorite chapter or your favorite paragraph or just something that's so heartwarming that you would like to maybe read to us uh, for 30 seconds or 60 seconds? Uh -huh. yeah. I don't have the book right in front of me. I think it's right behind but, you. <laughs> yeah, is it right behind me? 
Yes, it is. <laughs> Your assistant can grab it maybe after the next break. <laughs> my buddy, my friend, yes. <laughs> but I like to speak from my heart. And, and what I would really like to say, and it's the essence of the book, is that every uh -huh. moment, every day, we have the opportunity to help, to make a difference. We can do it with a smile. We can do it with sitting, just sitting with someone, taking groceries, running in to do a little cleaning for them, and doing it in an inobtrusive way. And I hear constantly, Emery's so nice you can do this. I don't have the time. We do have the time. We do have the time. We prioritize. And we do everything we want to do. Isn't that That's the right. truth? <laughs> I, I think so. And I found when, when you give your life or your heart to God, and I'm not trying to be corny here, he gives you lots of time to get the other things done. But right. I would encourage everyone out there, you don't, you don't have to look far. Your neighbor, your community, the children uh, at the school, <clears throat> your children have friends with cancer. There's so much we can do. Drive a carpool. They're little things, but they change lives. Keep yep. your sense of humor. Keep your sense of humor. Laugh at yourself. Laugh at life. Get up mm -hmm. in the morning and summon with complete dedication your gift of joy and spread it. Spread yeah. it. Great, great advice to caregivers because, you know, they are so consumed with what they're doing. And even those who are not caregivers, everyone knows a person who has cancer is fighting it. Everyone knows a cancer yes. survivor. Everybody knows a caregiver. Yeah. I mean, it it's can true. start out as, as simple as the guy next door who just... You know, you peek out your window, you see this old guy, you know, struggling to get his newspaper every morning. So you decide, well, I'm, I'm going to get his paper for him. Next thing you know, you're in there. It's a little you're, thing. You're, you're reaching a, a top shelf things top for shelf. him that he can't Absolutely. get. Next thing you know, you're making him breakfast. Next thing you know, he's asking you to take him to the doctor. And next thing you know, <laughs> you're his caregiver, and you don't know how it happened. But uh, <laughs> it doesn't have to be you know, a negative experience because... Uh, no, no. And, hey, and I'm it's going so to the store. Rewarding. Is there the something gift... you want me to pick up for you, for example? Or, yes. you know, would you like me to babysit your wife so that uh, you can go, uh, you know, to the spa or to uh, get your nails done or Starbucks or a massage? You know, just little things like that mean so much to a caregiver. And, yeah, you I, know, it's my... a gift we give ourselves, isn't it? The feeling that comes from that is so joyful when mm -hmm. you know you've made a difference. It's yeah. a gift Adrian? we give us. Mm -hmm. Adrian? No, I was, I was just thinking about my mother-in-law and the neighborhood in Brooklyn and just the one physical building that she lived in. There were about six widows um, who just took care of each other. Um, none of them were ill, uh, but they didn't get around the way they used to. They were all in their late 80s, and they'd call each other every day, and they would talk, and they would find out, I'm going to the store, do you need anything? So it, it, you don't have to be, you know, the this young, vibrant, you know, kid helping yeah. the guy next door. You can just you don't have to turn into help a big your deal. friends. It's not a big deal. No. Just do it. That's yeah. what I said. You, you don't have to look far. And uh, something else that I talk about in the book and um, like to dwell on a little bit when I have an opportunity is forgiveness. You know, I, I have met, uh, praying uh, with people around the world, so many that tell me, I forgive, I'm a lover, but if there is just one, that you can't forgive. You can't call yourself a forgiver or a lover. And that unforgiveness holds us in bondage. We are creating stress for us. Mm -hmm. And it's so important that we remember that and let go, just give it to God. You know, if people could remember who they are, really are, 
children of God, made in his image and likeness. They're spectacular. Everybody is. God doesn't make junk. <laughs> Everyone is miraculous. <laughs> with a different mission. Nobody looks alike. Nobody talks alike or walks alike. We're very, very special. And if we could remember that, I don't think we would have all the ugliness that we have in the world. But also, I know that if you're saying something unkind to me, it has nothing to do with me. You can't love me till you love you. It starts uh, with self. So love self. yourself. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. You know, the Bible says love others the way you love yourselves. And so many people don't love themselves, and, and they even think it's wrong to love themselves. Oh, no, 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 that would be selfish. Oh, no. no. I say, mm -hmm. if you need a friend, be a friend, right? They say that. But I yes. say, if you need a friend, be your own best friend. Take mm -hmm. yourself to yes. the movies. Oh, I can never go to the movies by myself. Why not? I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And then, and you know, by loving yourself, like you said, you can love others appropriately. And, and I feel strongly, this is just my thinking, there may be others that agree with me, but um, it doesn't matter, I'll say it anyway, there are two emotions, love and fear. You are either in love or you are in fear. Jealousy, envy, resentment, any negativity is coming from fear, fear that I'm not enough, but we are all of us and if we can remember that we move right into love right yeah, and, there, and there are some other people who say the opposite of love is not hate it is indifference because let's face mm. it you know you we all know couples mm. who who've been married for 50 years and they just do nothing but fight and bicker and complain and are yeah. sarcastic to each other they chop each other down but for yeah. some reason um they do love each other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if something were to happen, you know, even ex-wives and ex-spouses have been known to become the caregiver to their ex-spouse who they've been divorced sure. for 25 years to because, you know, somehow there's something inside of them that loves them. Mm -hmm. okay. We can't live together, but we can love, uh, uh, you know, I can love them, I can care for them. Even Billy Graham um, uh, his wife, he, she was asked, uh, do you ever think of divorce? And she mm. thought for a while, and she says, hmm, divorce, no. Murder, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. You know, it, it, that's so important, what you mm. said, Dave, because I did an interview a month or so ago with um, public radio, mm. and right in the middle of it, uh, the woman doing the interview was talking about uh, her situation, and they were divorced, separated. The husband got cancer, mm. and she took care of him right till the end, mm. right till the end. Mm -hmm. So there is a bond yeah. that we don't understand. Only God himself, one day he'll tell us, right? Yes, and we're <laughs> out of time. So tell us how to get a hold of you, how to buy your book, and all of that stuff. Yes, I would love the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. I have a website, and it's author com. Very, very simple. You can get very the good. book anywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. But I must say this before we part. I have mm -hmm. a daughter who has had multiple sclerosis for 20 mm -hmm. years and can't walk. She's beautiful. She was an equestrian and a champion tennis player. Mm -hmm. So the proceeds from this book, every penny, is going to multiple sclerosis, the foundation oh. in North Carolina. So awesome. this is for Corey, for Corey mm -hmm. and everyone like her. For so Corey I'm very, very like grateful. Her. Thank you. Yep. And thank Adrian you, is at uh, thecaregiverspace.org, and right. uh, her email is adrian at thecaregiverspace.org. I am caregiverdave.com, dave at caregiverdave.com if you want to communicate. Thank you so much for letting us uh, come into your living room or wherever it is you are, and we're just so grateful. And until next time, bye-bye. Thank you. You're gracious for having me. Yeah. No problem. Sometimes it feels 
Like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. Keep.